Hi folks, let's experiment. I want to machine a mold on our Tormach. I want to use some smooth on urethane to cast it and I want to see if we have a viable product for our Saunders Machine Works fixture plates. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. So this is what I love as an entrepreneur, fail fast, fail cheap. We've designed this mold and we headed over to the machine, but one of the first things I noticed was the file size. The no smoothing version was 7.6 megs. And we're gonna get this error from PathPilot. Here's the thing, it's actually okay. It's more of a warning that because the program exceeds 100,000 lines, it can't just give us the full preview, but it will not affect machine performance. However, this is a warning to me of should we use smoothing to reduce our file size, but more importantly, improve our tool paths. So our pre-smoothing operation, the whole file size was 7.6 megs. If we take a look at certain individual operations, like this adaptive operation, it is 484 kilobytes, that's about half a megabyte. What I did under edit passes was I added a smoothing tolerance of one thousandth of an inch. Now we've got some videos coming on how to think about and set your tolerances and smoothing in Fusion 360, but as a real quick explanation to what smoothing is, let's sketch a spline. As you post out code to your machine controller, your CNC machine, it actually doesn't machine this perfect path. In fact, that's especially true with splines. It splits them up into lines and arcs. Smoothing says, follow this line subject to your cumulative tolerance. And again, we'll get into that later, but one way to think about it is we're saying with smoothing, you can deviate off of this line by up to half a thousandth of an inch or one thousandth of an inch. So it's a pretty small amount. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute here, I don't want to ruin my tolerance. One thing to keep in mind is that accuracy and surface finish are not the same thing. Accuracy would mean I have to hit every single point on my model. And a lot of times that would mean you've got this kind of jerky motion. Smoothing, which is I think technically supposed to be called arc filtering because we're filtering the arc tolerance here, actually can help your machine move in a more fluid motion at the very minor expense of accuracy, but at the benefit of surface finish. And that's what we want here for our mold. Adding a few 1,000 smoothing tolerances has reduced the lines of code and reduced this file size by over half to 3.5 megabytes. Our Tormox can handle large files just fine. Older machines might not be able to handle these large files, and so that's a good example. If you've got to use VMC, smoothing is your friend for file size. But even on our Tormox with PathPilot, where file size is an issue, we want this for better motion profiles and better parts. Dropping our piece of aluminum onto the 770, I definitely wanted the 10,000 RPMs here. Using the Heimer to set our X, Y, Z at the top center of our piece of raw material. And I committed one of the cardinal sins. Who remembers our recent video on nine ways to crash your CNC machine? Can't say why, I forgot to set my Z height. That is how you crash machines in a really bad manner. So. One of those things that's super fun to edit out and not show that it happened, but it happened. Luckily here we aired on the high side and not the low side, so no crash. Cleaning up our ends with a half inch roughing end mill, 400 surface feet per minute, and four thousandths of an inch per tooth. Now we're cleaning up the left edges for a finish tolerance, and this is important in case I have to reset this part up, I want a good surface to reference off of. 850 surface feet per minute, tooth out per tooth. So I'm using that same half inch tool as a horizontal for the face, and here's why. My machine most certainly has a little bit of tram error, and I don't want the face mill to exaggerate that tram error. So using the half inch end mill keeps any tram error minimized in terms of the flatness of that top face. The way we control the horizontal to avoid it from also machining this lower portion, in effect using horizontal as a facing op, is under heights, just set the bottom height to the model top, and you can see that horizontal stays only on the top plane, like so. After that, adaptive out the majority of this material we're cooking here, 1,000 surface feet a minute, two and a half thou feet per tooth.
quick cleanup pass around the side just to give us a good edge finish and then we're on to the detail work. So we're roughing with a 332nd end mill. Believe it or not, those tools are fairly strong. You can really do some work with them. The biggest reason we see people break them is chip evacuation. Using all the RPMs that we've got here, 10,000 RPMs, sorry, I should say RPM to be correct, 1,000th of an inch feed per tooth. The trick though is under our passes tab, 25 thou optimal load, and doing multiple step downs. If we take a look at a wireframe view, you can see what this looks like. Again, we're opening that pocket up. We're doing the infusion adaptive and we take for granted how awesome this is. Once you get those settings right, I really trust it. Really good for chip evacuation and a great use of where the fog buster with its air blast can really help us evacuate those chips, which again comes back to process reliability. Anytime we recut the chip, we're introducing an extra chip load or vibration to the tool. It affects surface finish, it risks immediately breaking it, or it risks chipping an edge or contributing to a micro cracking that can cause failure later on. The way we can this up from a workflow standpoint, and I've only selected two of the holes, and then we right click, add to new pattern, and we've created a linear pattern. This makes it easier to avoid having to do a bunch of selections uh, all we had to do was duplicate that pattern for the set of inside holes, which are on a different spacing. After we've done that roughing adaptive to get rid of most of the material, we're doing a subsequent adaptive operation. We're doing this with a 1 16th ball end mill. I really like this because ultimately my goal is to use that same tool for the scalloping operation to come in and do the surfacing and really give us our final geometry but I don't want that tool to see surprise material or some additional amount of material. So by using it in an adaptive with rest machining on, and by the way, card here to last week's Fusion Friday where we talk about how you adjust the rest machining to avoid those pesky whisper cuts. But in this adaptive here, I can control the optimal load where Fusion is looking at the solid model and it's ensuring really quite well that that tool isn't going to all of a sudden see additional material. That material may well break the tool, but the other thing is just like Rob Lockwood talked about in his Autodesk University presentation on surface finishes, one of the keys to surface finishes is you have to present the tool with the same amount of material. In other words, it has to have the same pressure or deflection as it surfaces, and this will help us do that. When we get to the scallop, again, all the RPMs we've got only 21 inches a minute. I wanted to take it easy. Honestly, I probably could have gone faster, but again, here, I just wanted to get it done. Not the quickest operation. Each hole is a little over a minute, and this whole mold itself is about an hour, but I don't care. Set it and forget it. I want to end up an hour or two later having a part that I can take over and I can cast. I'm not in a uh, contest to prove who gets it done fastest right now. Later, maybe. Time to smooth on. <laughs> Who wants to hop in their time machine? So February 20th, 2010, I am still in Manhattan on the Upper East Side, New York City. I had this idea for this part. What was this? This was one of the axle dampeners for our Strike Mark rifle target system, where it was a huge quote and cost to have these machined. I only had my tag, and so I cat this was Dear gosh, back when we had Bobcat, I can't believe I had to say that out loud, sorry, where we're using our tag to machine these molds. Now, I really didn't know what I was doing back then, but we still got it done. We got it made with a machine that weighed 80 pounds, but this was my first introduction to Smooth On, which is an awesome product by a pretty darn awesome company. They have been great on their customer service and their breadth of product. So. First, we're spraying it with mold release, very important. There's people that use mold release and there's people that will use mold release. Uh, you, don't, it's, you don't wanna deal with the mold where you can't get out your, uh, your part or casting. So spray it down. You do want to be really careful when you mix the weights of these. A scale works or something like a syringe or measuring tool. It's messy stuff. It can smell, depends on which compound you have. So typical safety, uh, stuff in terms of gloves, ventilation, eye masks, and so forth. 
but it's also really fun and really easy. Now, one of the best things to do is to degas your mold, and we've got something coming. We just picked up a little vacuum chamber. We already have a pump. I believe we can reuse our Pearson pump. So degassing really helps, but again, here, fail fast, fail cheap. It didn't matter for what we were trying to do. I wanted to get this thing made. I want to see, is this a good solution for our fixture plates to plug these holes? We got a quote for uh, over 100,000 individual plugs from a high production volume lathe shop, and the price per part was pretty inexpensive, but it didn't make sense because our large fixture plate has 400 and 71 holes. You're still spending upwards of $100 or $200 on individual plugs that are, frankly, not fun to take in and out. So this is our idea. I want to see if it works. The benefit here is it offers a layer of protection to your table when you drop that screwdriver, that crescent wrench, or maybe even the tool. It depends on how heavy or sharp it is. And we want to make them so that they're inexpensive enough so that you can cut them away to fit custom fixtures or vice or clamps or so forth. Fixture is cured, it's, it's done, let's go try it out. Folks, this is awesome, take a look. The first one was the one you just watched. After that, we iterated, and that's what I love about doing what we do, that's how I got started. It's fail fast, it's fail cheap. We wanted a different smooth on formula, the one that cured differently, the one that we thought could be clear. Ends up the clear wasn't as clear as we'd like, and this was before our degas had arrived, so we tried black. I didn't like black at first, but then, we tried to clear again, and it has that sort of just slight amount of uh, variable translucence. Talked to Smooth On, and they said, you know, we really don't guarantee optical clarity on that one. They have one that's three times more expensive than they do, but that doesn't really make sense. So we tried the black again with a new mold. We've got the Saunders Machine Works logo ever so subtly on there. Absolutely awesome. We've got another one. We took a knife, made some cutouts to accommodate the strap clamps for our vise. Again, why do I love this? It's quick to remove, quick to add. We wanna price these low enough that you can take one and cut it up or modify it. If you drop that screwdriver, you drop that bolt, you're not gonna be damaging, unlikely, hopefully, to damage anything now. And it keeps the chips out of those boards, which makes for such an easier way to sweep off your machine to keep it clean and run a nice shop. So. We're gonna release these under a beta program. We'll probably ship them in a few weeks. Card here to the Saunders Machine Works page if you own a fixture plate and you're interested in trying these out. Otherwise, folks, thanks for watching. Take care. See you soon.